This is my review of Journey to the West, Volume 1, part of the four-volume set of Journey to the West. And in the previous video, I explained what this book was, why I'm reading it, and why I've chosen to discuss it volume by volume for the time being. Uh, and so I'm not going to repeat any of that. I'm just going to jump right into talking about Volume 1. Uh, if you happen to miss the previous video, I'll give a link to it in the description down below. So uh, Volume 1 is, uh, is a lot of setup before we actually get into the journey to the West. Uh, the first nine chapters are the monkey's backstory. Uh, so as I, I mentioned in the previous video, even though this book is uh, a stench, uh, the, the story originated as the journey of a monk to India, uh, I, I believe over time the, the monkey kind of took over this story. So uh, it starts with his, his being born. He uh, gets born from a, a stone egg, which just happened to be on a mountaintop. And it's a little bit unclear with the monkey, as with the pig who, who later shows up, how much he's a real monkey and how much he's a spirit. Um, because it, it, he, he's often described as a monkey, but he's, he's obviously special right from the beginning. He gets born from this egg, which is on a mountaintop instead of being a uh, you know, uh, instead of having a normal mother and father monkey. But at any rate, uh, once he's born, he's, he's living on this island, which has a big mountain, and there are all these other monkeys with them. Uh, and uh, there's a... They discovered this palace under the waterfall. So th there's, there's a waterfall on the mountain, and... Uh, he, he says to the other monkeys, uh, let's go through and explore, and whoever goes through first will be our king. And the other monkeys agree to that. So they, they jump through the water. He jumps through the waterfall, and he, he finds this huge palace un, in, in, a, in a hollow space in the mountain, which is you can get through by jumping through the waterfall. If memory served, it's never, it's never explained where this palace comes from. Um, but that's what he finds, and he, he invites the other monkeys to join with him there. And they have everything they could ever want in this palace. So they're eating and drinking, and they're enjoying the, the luxuries of the palace. And they, they live for 300 years. Uh, memory serves, it's also not explained why they're all living so long. I guess the... the, the monkeys on this island all have long lifespans. Now, uh, it's only a couple minutes into this review, and I'm already uh, becoming a little bit unsure of some of the details. You, you may have to excuse that a little bit in this review. There is so much stuff that happens at such a fast pace throughout this volume one that it's a little bit difficult to keep the details straight in my head looking back at it. And um, I, I suspect that's probably a common reading experience. I, I don't know, maybe I'm getting old, but there, there's just so much that happens. It, it's, it's a fun book to read because of the relentless fast pace of events. It, it slows down in parts, but for, for the most part, it's just relentlessly fast paced. I, I don't know. Let, let me know what your reading experience of this book was, if, if, if you've read it. But at a, at a certain point, uh, he gets a little tired of just enjoying himself, and he, he starts to get depressed because he's, he's going to die someday. Um, so I, I, I guess these monkeys, even though they can live a very long time, are not immortal. They, they do die. Uh, and the other monkeys say, well, why are you so depressed? Why, why don't you just enjoy eating and drinking and, and being merry like us? And he said, well, because I know I'm going to die. And so he goes out to seek immortality or enlightenment. Now, now here, here's where I get a little bit confused. And there, there are a lot of things on this book where I'm a little bit confused of. Um, I, I should say that the basic narrative of this book 
is very easy to follow. Actually, sorry, maybe I should have started with that point. This book is easy to read. Uh, I mean, I, I know w whenever you come to a classic, like a 16th century Chinese classic, you're like, oh no, is this gonna be a real struggle to get through? It's not. It's easy to read, uh, it's fun to read, it's very fast paced, it's lots of action, it's funny. Uh, it, it is, the, the narrative is easy to follow and it's a lot of fun. There are any number of things I'm slightly confused about, but th those are all things that are kind of around the margins. The, the basic storyline is quite easy to follow. But one, one of the things that is a little bit confusing to me along the margins is um, there, there appear to be a number of different religious aspects intersecting in this book. So uh, at its heart, it's, it's a Buddhist book. It's about a, a monk who goes to the, the West to get uh, the Buddhist scriptures. But it, it also seems to be intersecting, intersecting with a lot of Chinese mythology about the heavenly kingdom and all the gods and the various kingdoms. Uh, and I really, th this is not, I, I, know, I know nothing about this. This is not my area of expertise. So I, I, I have this vague understanding that Buddhism started out as a very simple religion. You know, you just meditate to get enlightenment. And then over time, it accumulated a lot of additional mythology as it came into China and Japan. But outside of that vague understanding, I, I really don't know much. And the other thing, apparently, there's a lot of Taoism in this book. Taoism is another thing I, I know very little about. The, the, in the introduction, uh, the, the, I think the introduction is actually not by the translator. It's, it's by somebody else. Let, let me double check that. Uh, yeah, the introduction is by Professor Shi Cheng Wu. So that's, that's somebody different than who, who does the, the uh, translation. But the, in the introduction, he does talk about the, uh, how this book um, is about Buddhism, but was written during a time in which Taoism was dominant. So there's a lot of intersection of, of them. Um, however, having, having given that warning in the introduction, he does not really attempt to dissect it much and explain how, how they're interacting. So uh, I, I just have to... I just know that there's some confusion going on somewhere in this book, but I don't really know how. But through some sort of spiritual practice, the monkey is able to gain some sort of, I don't know whether to call it enlightenment. Uh, he's able to gain some sort of, yeah, some sort of enlightenment where he, he's able to achieve a sort of immortality. He's able to achieve special magical powers uh, like uh, being able to float up on a cloud and zoom around, being able to change his form. Uh, and he, he achieves all these things by training with a, a monk at a monastery and, and learning all these, these different meditations that you can do to en enhance your spiritual being, to acquire these magical powers. Uh, and it's, it's made very clear in this book that the, um, the way of meditation is not only open to humans, it's, it's open to all mammals, uh, animals, who, who are uh, willing to, to study it. And um, later on in the book, the monkey is going to encounter other animals who, who have acquired these magical powers through meditation with Buddhism or Taoism or, or something like that. So he, he goes to a monastery to study. He's taken as one of the disciples. Uh, and he, he uh, through years of study, is able to acquire all these things as, as well as immortality. Uh, and then he goes back to his monkey kingdom with all these powers. Um, and uh, he immediately starts having all these adventures. So when he comes back, there's some sort of demon king 
who's uh, harassing his subjects. So he goes out and he, he fights with the demon king, uh, and he, he starts uh, being aggressive with some of the other uh, neighboring kingdoms near him, or he goes underwater to visit the dragon king and demand uh, armor and weapons. Um, and uh, these sections are incredibly readable, and they're a lot of fun. So the, the monkey is coming across as incredibly arrogant, going around and demanding everything. And as I, I mentioned in my previous video, I'm told that this comes through better in the original Chinese, but it comes through well enough in the English translation. You, you can see that he, even in the English translation, he, he's being uh, really demanding and arrogant. Um, but the other thing which is so fun to read about this is all these different kingdoms which are existing in this book. So there's this, this animal kingdom on this kind of paradise island where the monkey lives. There's like the demon kingdom. Then he goes uh, underwater to the dragon kingdom. And the, the dragon is being attended by all these underwater creatures. So there's, um, you know, like uh, octopuses and sea turtles and... and trout and fish who, who are all part of this underwater ocean kingdom and are attending the, 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 the dragon and are all kind of part of the dragon's army uh, or have different positions in the dragon's court. Uh, and so it's, it's just an incredibly imaginative book. And I have no idea how much of this is just taking existing Chinese mythology and how much of this is unique to this book, because like I said, I have no background on it. But I, I guess the positive point is uh, I was able to understand the story well enough without, without any of the, that background. So after causing a lot of havoc, uh, the other uh, creatures uh, or kingdoms eventually complained to heaven. Um, now, what, one of the, again, one of the really fun things about this book is its description of heaven. And once again here, I don't know how much of this comes from pre-existing mythology and how much is, this is unique to the book, but heaven is described as this huge bureaucracy where they're all, there's this jade emperor in heaven, but he's got all these different positions under him. And it, again, I, I think this is, I, I'm told that aspects of this are supposed to be a satire on um, the Chinese government at the time that the book was uh, the book was written, but I, I it's it, it's all over my head. Um, so the uh, they're they're debating what to do about this monkey, uh, and uh, one of one of them who uh, I believe is the the planet Venus or the planet Venus, as it is in in Chinese mythology, so not. Not, of course, the Greek goddess Venus, but uh, the, the planet as it's in Chinese mythology. The, the great white planet uh, says, okay, well, well, why don't we, why don't we, instead of fighting him, let's just bring him into heaven and give him an honorific position so that he's, uh, he thinks that he's part of us. And that will make him happy, and that will keep him under trouble, and that will allow him to watch us. So they they uh, they do that. They they make him protector of the horses. So he's given this title, and uh, he's given all these uh, grand ceremonial duties, and he, he thinks he's important now because he's part of the heavenly court. But after a while, he he realizes what's happened. He he realizes he's been given a, a completely menial job up in heaven. So he, he raises this huge ruckus. Uh, and then the, the, after uh, a lot of commotion and fighting, they heaven eventually relents. Uh, and they say, okay, uh, you, you, you are now the great sage equal to heaven himself. So he's given this, this title. He, he's no longer the lowly protector of the horses. He's given this huge title. But it's a meaningless title, and eventually the monkey figures that out as well. Um, as well as uh, he has 
being a monkey, he just has this natural propensity to mischief. So he gets into everything. He eats everything he's not supposed to eat. Uh, he, he eats these... Um, he goes into the peach garden and eats all these peaches he's not supposed to eat, uh, as well as these elixir pills, which are supposed to convey immortality. I mean, he, he's already immortal, uh, but he, he just guzzles down a whole bunch of them, which makes him like really super immortal now or really powerful. Uh, and he, he creates such a havoc that eventually heaven decides that they're going to have to subdue him. Only at this point, he is so powerful that he can't be subdued. Uh, so there's a long battle in which different heavenly beings are fighting the uh, monkey. And once again, I am not sure how much of these people are come from pre-existing Chinese mythology and how much of it is uh, unique to this book. I'm, I'm guessing that th this, this book is building off of uh, pre-existing Chinese mythology. You, you know, like in the same way when you read the Iliad, the Iliad is describing, you know, uh, Zeus and Hera and Poseidon fighting but Zeus and Hera and Poseidon uh, did not originate with the Iliad. Uh, the Iliad is, is taking these pre-existing gods from Greek mythology to tell this story. I, I think that's what's going on here. Because the, these different gods and goddesses and their families are kind of introduced in a way that, that seems to assume the readers some sort of familiarity with them. Um, there's a there's a prince Urhang uh who who's uh under his his father is some sort of big guy in heaven and he fights the monkey for ages and ages now there's also the uh hopefully I'm going to pronounce this right the Buddha Vista um which is not the Buddha uh, but is, is one of the Buddha's disciples. Um, so, sorry, not this is the Bud, Bad, Bodhisattva. Bodhisattva. I'll, I'll try and remember to, to leave a written um, spelling of, of these names that I'm mispronouncing in the description down below. Yeah, so. Some of the stuff I, I did try and Google a little bit, and I I, I in, intentionally did not spend too much time Googling all the names here because uh, I, I did not want this book to turn into a research project, which I think it could easily do. But apparently, uh, apparently to what little Googling I did, Bodhisattva in Buddhism is uh, somebody who's achieved enlightenment but uh, rather than going into nirvana, they kind of stay to help other people achieve enlightenment. But then the bodhisattva in China and some of the other countries took on a specific form as this female figure called Guan Yin who I believe is this female Buddha that you often see in China and Vietnam and in Japan and other countries. So not just a Bodhisattva in general, but uh, the, the specific female Buddha called Guan Yin. And she gets involved and she has with her an apprentice who's known as Haiyan the novice because he, he's, he's the novice who's training under her. But he is also known as Prince Maksa because he's got a title in heaven. Uh, and I, I believe his, his father is also the father who's the, of Prince Ur Hang. So these, there, there seems to be a pre-existing mythology which this story is already making use of. Now, I, 
I don't want to make it sound like this book is really complicated or intimidating. Uh, on the surface level, you can understand exactly what's going on uh, without really knowing who these people are. And I, for the most part, w was able to, to follow that. It is also at the same time really intriguing to kind of get these this glimpse into a deeper mythology and it's tempting to want to research that. Although that, that being said though, that being said, I googled Prince Moxa and Huayan the novice and could not find any references to them off of Google aside from references to Journey to the West, so aside from this book. It could well be, though, that there's just not a lot of information about them in English. I, I think I'm discovering the more I get into this, the more that Wikipedia and other websites maybe are deficient in their Chinese and Buddhism mythology. Uh, it, it's interesting. I, I mean, this is... This is one of the reasons I started reading Buddha by Osama Tezuku, which, which I've been reading concurrently with this book, is because I've been getting so much references to Buddhism in this book, I thought, okay, may, maybe this would make a nice supplement to this book. Now, so far, actually, these, the, there's been no intersection at all here. Uh, the Bodhisattva and the Heavenly Kingdom and all that other stuff is not... And Tezuka Osama's Buddhism at all. So in, in that respect, they, they do not complement each other at all, although they're both interesting books for their own reasons, and I'm glad I'm reading them for completely separate reasons. But, but in attempting to research the legend of Buddha on Wikipedia, and attempting to research Chinese mythology on Wikipedia for this book, be between both of those experiences, I'm really notice noticing a deficit in, in uh, the information available on Wikipedia. And I had just assumed that in 2023, all of human knowledge was on Wikipedia. Um, but I, I, I think there's, there's a lot of deficits in Wikipedia that still need to be filled in, at least in the English version, on Chinese and Buddhist mythology and and you know maybe 10 years from now it will be different but at, at, at the moment at the moment it's 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 difficult to research this there doesn't seem to be a lot of stuff on there but i i, I get the impression that um for a chinese audience maybe this stuff would be funnier because you're you're taking these uh gods and goddesses that perhaps you're familiar with from pre-existing mythology and putting them in their, these ridiculous situations where they're fighting this monkey. Uh, and it just goes on and on and on. I mean, the monkey gets captured, then he escapes again, and then the, 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 then the fight all starts all over again. Eventually, after several chapters of this fight just going on, uh, Buddha himself gets called in. Now, I assume this is the Buddha. Uh, and he's able to trick the monkey into getting trapped in his hand, but his hand turns into the five mountains. And then the monkey is then now trapped under that mountain, and he's finally trapped. Um, and then, after chapter nine, we're done with the monkey's backstory. Uh, and then we go into a whole bunch of other backstories. So there's a, a there's a backstory there's there's essentially three different backstories here, um, maybe three and a half depending on how you count them. So there's the backstory of the monk, uh, and and what his story is, and it turns out that he has this whole story where his father gets murdered by bandits and then his mother gives birth to him and his mother tries to hide him in a monastery. And I'm not going to get into the whole thing, but there's this whole soap opera about his backstory uh, and how he's eventually reunited with his parents uh, and they get revenge 
uh, on the uh, the bandits who who killed his father. His father even comes back to life through this whole convoluted story. Um, now, this monk is often referred to as the golden cicada. <sighs> occasionally referred to as a golden cicada. He's referred to the golden cicada in some of the chapter headings and some of the poems uh, and a little bit near the end. And it's a little bit confusing, like, well, why, why are they calling him the golden cicada? And there's a brief reference to the golden cicada being reincarnated, but it wasn't really clear in the book. This, this actually, this is one of those things where I did it. I, I, I did have to Google this. So apparently the golden cicada was a disciple of Buddha who, and as I, it's a little bit unclear to me if the golden cicada was his nickname or if he was actually a golden cicada. But at one point he, he said, okay, Buddha, I don't want to listen to you talk anymore. I, I, it's some sort of defiance. So as punishment for that defiance, he's got to get reincarnated 10 times and, and earn merit. That... Sorry, I, I know I've been saying all along that you can follow this book perfectly fine without going to the internet, but that one detail, uh, I, I, at least for me, required me going to the internet to clear up exactly what the connection between the golden cicada and this monk was. Um, it, 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 it's, it seems to me a little bit odd because the monk is described, you know, as like this super great holy guy uh, who, who's always like holier than everybody else and always does the right things and everybody loves him and he's so wonderful. But then the golden cicada apparently had done, had done this horrible thing where he refused to listen to Buddha. So he, he's on this punishment cycle of reincarnation. Um, so that, that, that disconnect between uh, the golden cicada who is a fallen disciple of Buddha and the monk, who is a super great disciple of Buddha, but they're actually the, the same being, just in a different reincarnation, I thought was interesting. I don't know if that will get explored more in the future volumes, but it's, it's something that's just briefly name-dropped here, not even pro properly explained in volume one. Okay, so that, there, there's the monk's backstory. Uh, and then there's also the Tang Emperor. Now, the Tang Emperor is the Emperor of China, uh, who is, again, is a real historical figure. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure if I understood Chinese history better, I, I could appreciate more what's going on in this book. There are some references in this book to uh, the dynasty and his father and stuff like that. But I, again, I did not... I did not research this thoroughly on Wikipedia because I, I don't want this to turn into a research project. But uh, um, the, the Tang Emperor, uh, yeah, he gets mixed up in this thing with the Dragon King. Uh, so yeah, before we get to the Tang Emperor, we go on another tangent talking about why the Dragon King uh, is punished to die and then uh, the, Tang, the Dragon King appeals to the Tang Emperor, um, and the Tang Emperor promises him that he won't be executed, but then the Dragon King gets executed anyways, and then the Tang Emperor um, has to go, has to die and go to the underworld, and there's this whole story about that. And that, that part is, seems to be, very unconnected to the rest of the story, even though it was on for a couple chapters. Although we get some really interesting chapters about the Chinese idea of the land of the dead and uh, all the bureaucracy that's in the land of the dead. Um, the land of the dead is this big bureaucracy, just like uh, heaven is. So, uh, and there's some really descriptive things about all the different people who are being punished in the land of the dead. And it's kind of a, a bit like, I don't know, Dante's Inferno, um, which I also haven't read, but how I imagine Dante's Inferno to be. But uh, I, I guess the, the, the takeaway from all of that is because of that experience, the Tang Emperor 
comes out with a, a renewed commitment to religion. So the Tang Emperor wants to sponsor uh, religious pilgrimages. And then we get uh, the Buddhasatta, uh, the Guan Yin, uh, the, the woman Buddha, who goes with her uh, Huayan, the novice, uh, to, um, to set up the journey to the West. So she, she gets the instruction from Buddha that they need to send some sort of monk to the West to get the scriptures. So she has to go to a certain town to, se to select a monk to, to go on that pilgrimage. And on the way, she meets uh, various creatures who, uh, who are in need of redemption. So here she meets the, the dragon, a, a different dragon. There are a lot of dragons in the story. Um, and she meets the pig. Now, the pig uh, is uh, not really a pig. He's the reincarnation of some heavenly general who is getting punished, but is in a pig's body or at least what is kind of like a pig's body. I, you know, I, you get the impression. I got the impression that it was kind of like an anthropomorphic pig. So like, you know, the face of a pig, but he's got hands because the, the pig has this rake that he uses as a weapon. But it, it, again, it's not entirely clear. Uh, and then Friar Sand, who is some sort of magic creature, I don't know, some sort of demon or something. Uh, and then, of course, the monkey, uh, who has been trapped under the mountain for 500 years. We, at this point in the story, we've jumped forward 500 years time. So the monkey gets promised that if, if he goes on this journey, he's going to get let out of the mountain. And the monkey says, fine, fine. If you, if you let me out, I'll help the monk. So then we get to the whole thing about why the monk is selected. And then the monk goes on his journey and he encounters various dangers as he goes on the journey. But he also gradually gets the disciples. So first, uh, the, the monk meets up with the monkey. Now the monkey is, uh, he says he's reformed, but he's not really reformed. He's, he's going back uh, to his old mischievous nature. So the woman Buddha, uh, gives the, the monk uh, a headband, which the monkey is tricked into putting on. And then the, if the monk says a sort of chant, the, the headband can contract. Uh, and uh, it, it causes the monkey a lot of pain and brings the monkey into the monk's control. Then I think, I think they pick up the dragon next, and then the pig next, and then Friar Sand. And there, there are adventures in between. Um, and then right about the time the whole crew is assembled, uh, the, I think they have a couple adventures together and then, uh, volume one has come to an end. So volume one is a lot of setup for this story. Now I've been told that volumes two, three, and four are going to be a lot more straightforward and for better or for worse, apparently a lot more repetitive. The, these five, uh, the, the monk and his four disciples, the monkey, the pig, the, the dragon who's being used as a horse and Friar Sand uh, are going to go on a lot more adventures. And apparently the monkey and the pig are going to be the standout characters and the, the other ones are going to be mostly in the background. Okay, so... That was my long-winded recap of the plot. Um, it is... Yeah. It's, it's been a lot of fun to read. Um, there are... You could easily abridge this if you wanted to. Uh, and the, um, there are a lot of abridged versions of this book in print. So there are a whole lot of chapters that go on long tangents that don't really affect the main plot at all, like the, the Tang Emperor's journey to the land of the dead, or a lot of the backstory about the monk's parents, or all this kind of stuff. Um, but, yeah, even though there's a lot of stuff even though there's a lot of side stories in here, 
each individual side story is a lot of fun to read. There's so much imagination, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of the dead, the underwater dragon kingdom. It's just so fun, and, and it mostly moves at a fast pace. I said mostly because there are a lot of poems inserted throughout. Uh, and whenever we get to a poem, uh, you kind of have to slow down and just read the poem. And I, I'm not quite sure where the poems come from. Uh, uh, my understanding is, again, by the time this got printed into one book in the 16th century, there had been a long accumulation over the years. So maybe these, these poems were pre-existing poems that had already been around and the author was incorporating them. I don't know, but you, you'll, you'll, you'll be going around uh, and the, the prose narration is, is very fast paced uh, and, and holds your attention very well. And then you will, you'll get to a poem for uh, either, you know, a few lines or sometimes the poem will even take up a couple pages depending on it. Uh, and my, I found the poems, it, on one level they're very easy to understand. I mean, they're very clear, straightforward, translation of these poems. On the other level, I don't know, maybe it's just me. Whenever I get to a poem, my brain just kind of switches off. and I've got to force myself a little bit to concentrate on what's in the, these poems. Although a lot of the time, the poems are just extra description. They don't really affect what's going on in the main plot. Sometimes parts of the narration will be advanced in the poem, but not always. Uh, but aside from all these poems being inserted, the poems I found a little bit irritating, but aside from that, the, the narration is fast paced, very imaginative, and, and very funny. Uh, the monkey is constantly getting into trouble. The pig is constantly getting into trouble, but in different ways. I mean, the monkey is getting into trouble the, the, it's interesting because they do have distinct characters. The monkey is, for, for the most part, getting into trouble because he's too smart for his own good. And he's always trying to kind of see ahead how he can take advantage of the situation. The pig is getting into trouble because he's too stupid. And so the pig is just easily tempted by just everything. He's just greedy. Uh, he, he's, he's just greedy. Um, so he, the pig is just getting tricked um, by all these evil spirits and into, into stupid things where the monkey is getting into trouble because the monkey's trying to take, in, take advantage of everybody he meets. Um, yeah, I, I, there, there, there is an element here where the, the monkey is just so super powerful and he can change his form and he can make you can make like a hundred monkeys uh, come out from his hair and he can create duplicates of himself. Uh, I was a little bit worried when, when it was built up very early on this book, all the monkeys' powers. I, I was thinking, okay, well, if he's going to be that powerful, then, then how are we going to even have a story here? How are we going to have antagonists for him to fight? Or how are we going to have... Uh, any sort of dilemmas for him to get into. Um, but I thought, well, okay, I, I'm, I'm just going to have to trust that this book is going to find interesting things for him to do. And for the most part, the, the book has been finding interesting things for him to do. I've been trying to turn off the overly critical part of my brain. You know, the part of your the brain that says, okay, well, the monkey's so powerful. Why Why... Why are we even going on this journey? Why doesn't the monkey just zoom over to the West and get those scriptures himself? Uh, and actually, that, to be fair, that is kind of addressed in the book. Uh, the monkey can't do it because there's some sort of rule that uh, a human has to walk. Uh, and uh, the monkey can't carry anyone when he's zooming around on his cloud. That's established. So they, 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 they do make 
stabs at kind of establishing what are the limitations on the monkey's power. But for the most part, I don't think you're supposed to think about it too much. You're just supposed to enjoy enjoy the scenery and, and, and uh, just kind of marvel at all these magical battles that the monkey is fighting with all these other creatures he, he encounters. Um, and and so, so I so I, I have been, uh, and we'll see how it goes through, through the rest of the volumes. But so far, I am really having a lot of fun with this book. Uh, perfectly readable. I'm sure there are a million allusions to 16th century Chinese politics that I'm not catching, but on just on a simple narrative level, I'm enjoying the humor of the story and the mythology and the imagination and uh, all the adventure and action in it. It's, it's, it's been a lot of fun so far. So uh, I'll come back someday with uh, my review of volume two. Um, but for, for now, that's my thoughts on volume one.